This is lecture four of our Canopy Analysis and Design course. In this lecture, we continue our discussion on how to use the ASCE 722 standard to determine the design wind load for the canopy. The wind load provisions are centered around two related parameters, wind velocity pressure, denoted by the letter Q, and design pressure, denoted by P. In lectures two and three, we described and determined the coefficients that define Q. For our bus terminal, the velocity pressure Q comes out to 26.21 newtons per square meter. The design pressure P depends on Q, the gust effect factor, the wind directionality factor, and two pressure coefficients, external pressure and internal pressure coefficients. For our purposes, ASCE, provides two distinct equations for calculating design pressure. Equation 27.3-1 and equation 27.3-2. Before I explain the difference between these two equations, let's talk about the terms they have in common. G, the gust effect factor, and KD, the wind directionality factor. The other terms, the external and internal pressure coefficients are related to the structure's form and enclosure condition. We'll come back to those shortly. Let's start with the gust effect factor. Picture holding an umbrella on a windy day. The wind doesn't blow steadily, it surges. One moment it's calm, and the next, a gust yanks the umbrella. Now, think of a structure in that same wind. If we designed only for average wind, we'd miss the higher forces caused by those brief intense gusts. The gust effect factor adjusts the wind pressure to account for them. Given its height and the configuration of its steel skeleton, our bus terminal is considered a rigid structure. According to ASCE 722, the gust effect factor for rigid buildings is 0.85, as noted in section 26.11.1. That raises an interesting question. If gusts amplify the effect of wind, why is the gust effect factor less than 1 for our structure? Consider a tall, flexible building. Under dynamic loading, it vibrates slowly. In general, the natural frequency of a structure is inversely proportional to its height. The taller the structure, the lower its natural frequency, and the slower its vibration. For tall buildings, gusts can align with the building's motion, causing dynamic amplification. That's why G is greater than 1 for such structures. In contrast, a shorter building has a higher natural frequency and vibrates more quickly. This faster vibration tends to be out of sync with wind gusts, making the gust effect negligible for short, rigid structures. Now, keep in mind that ASCE 7 defines wind speed as a three-second gust, not as an average wind. That means the gustiness of the wind is already built into the velocity pressure. So, for short, rigid buildings, we use a gust effect factor of less than 1 to account for the fact that gusts have an insignificant effect on the wind pressure applied to the structure. Now that we have determined the gust effect factor, let's turn our attention to the wind directionality factor, KD. The idea behind this factor is simple. Not every storm hits a structure from the worst possible direction. Wind can come from any angle, and most of the time it doesn't line up exactly with the direction that would create the highest force on the building. Imagine a structure that's most vulnerable to wind from the north. While that might be the critical direction in theory, wind in the real world doesn't always come from the north. It may come from the east, the west, or at an angle. Directions that might not be as severe for that particular structure. The wind directionality factor, KD, adjusts the design pressure to reflect this. 
It reduces the load slightly to account for the fact that wind isn't consistently coming from the direction that would cause the most damage. Now, that raises a reasonable question. Even if wind usually comes from other directions, isn't there still a chance it might strike the structure from its weakest side? And if so, shouldn't we design for that possibility? The answer is yes, we do consider that possibility, but not in isolation. The ASCE wind load provisions are part of a broader design framework with multiple layers of safety, high wind speed assumptions, strength reduction factors, and load combination requirements. Together, these safeguards ensure that the structure remains safe, even in those occasional cases when the wind aligns with the most vulnerable direction. For our bus terminal, KD is taken as 0.85. This value comes from Table 26.6-1, which provides recommended directionality factors for different types of structures and structural components. This means we design for 85% of the theoretical worst-case wind pressure. The reduction reflects the understanding that full alignment with the most critical wind direction is not always expected. Overall safety is still ensured through the use of built-in safety margins throughout the design process. Now let's turn our attention to the pressure coefficients. When wind hits a building, it creates pressure not just on the outside surfaces, but also on the inside, especially when there are openings. External and internal pressure coefficients help estimate how much pressure the wind applies to each side of a surface. The shape and layout of our bus terminal create an interesting challenge when it comes to wind analysis. The structure isn't fully enclosed like a typical building, nor is it completely open like a simple canopy. It's a mix of both. Part of the terminal is open just a roof supported by steel frames with no walls underneath. But another part includes enclosed office spaces built under the same roof. These differences matter because wind behaves differently depending on whether it can flow through a structure or gets trapped inside it. To fully understand how wind affects the terminal, we need to consider both situations. In the open areas, wind passes through, and the pressure acts mainly on the outer surfaces. In the enclosed areas, wind can also build up pressure inside. That internal pressure adds to the load the structure has to resist. So, to cover all possible wind effects on the frames, we'll consider two scenarios. One where the structure is treated as open, and one where it's treated as partially enclosed. This way, we can identify the most critical conditions and design the frames to handle them safely. We are going to use equation 27.3-1 for the partially enclosed portions of the bus terminal. This equation includes both internal and external pressure coefficients. For the open canopy areas, we'll use equation 27.3-2, which considers only external pressure since there is no enclosed volume to trap air. Using both equations allows us to evaluate wind pressure across the full range of conditions present in the structure. To apply these equations, we're going to follow the directional procedure described in Chapter 27. This method allows us to determine wind pressure on each surface of the structure based on the direction the wind is coming from. The directional procedure is appropriate for our bus terminal because it meets the two conditions listed in section 27.1.2. First, the structure has a regular shape, a straightforward rectangular layout. Second, it is rigid and low-rise, meaning it doesn't respond dynamically to wind. In other words, it's not subject to a crosswind effects. Since these conditions are satisfied, the directional procedure gives us a practical and reliable way to calculate the wind pressures on both the open and partially enclosed portions of the terminal. 
Let's begin with the open portion of the canopy. In a typical open segment, a flat roof is supported by four steel cantilever frames spaced 8 meters apart, resulting in a total width of 24 meters. Each frame consists of two columns and a 25 meter long cantilever beam at the top. The overall height of each frame is 8 meters. Given that the bus terminal has a long rectangular shape, it's reasonable to assume that the most critical wind loads occur when wind blows in the plane of the frames, that is, along the shorter direction of the structure, either from south to north or north to south. In our analysis, we'll focus on wind acting in these directions, since they're expected to produce the highest forces on the frames. We've now identified the critical wind directions and the key geometric features of the open frame segment. In the next lecture, we'll continue by determining the external pressure coefficients and, subsequently, the roof design pressures, along with their effect on the cantilever frame of the open system.